The United States Marine Corps found itself in the thick of the Chinese Civil War. Despite the fact that they had anticipated being sent home after World War II, representatives from Japan boarded the battleship U.S. Missouri, which was anchored in Tokyo Bay at the time, on September 2, 1945, in order to sign an instrument of unconditional surrender. It was largely due to the atomic bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki that World War II was brought to a speedy and decisive end. This news was very much appreciated by the members of the IAIA Marine Amphibious Corps (IIIAC), who were already in the process of preparing for the invasion of Japan that was being planned. The Leathernecks were aware that conducting an invasion of the Japanese home islands would have resulted in a deadly conflict. Over the course of the war, it was anticipated that the invasion would result in one million losses for the Allies. And would extend the conflict by two or three years. Now it appeared like the horror had come to an end, and the Marines were looking forward to going back to the United States. However, contrary to their expectations, the IIAC Marines discovered that they would be dispatched to China rather than returning home. Although this was a disheartening setback for many people. There were individuals who were eagerly looking forward to an exciting journey in the Far East. Private Harold Stevens, who served in the 29th Marine Regiment, was overjoyed to learn that he would not be returning to the farm that his family owned in Pennsylvania. Even though he was just 19 years old, he had already been through the horrific combat that had secured Okinawa. Many people in the United States who were born during Stevens' generation. Believed that China was still a nation filled with mystery and romance, exotic fishes, and attractive women. It was a location that had captured the attention of Marco Polo. A farm kid named Stevens was ready to be dispatched to that location. He had a hard time believing his fantastic good fortune. It is fascinating to learn about the post-war engagement of the Marines in China, but the story is not romantic in any way. It was Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, who was the leader of China during World War II, who made the initial appeal for assistance from the United States in securing northern China. There were almost two million Japanese people who were present at the time and needed to be returned to Japan. This included a significant number of active-duty military personnel. However, Chiang was also considering his most adversary, Mao Zedong. Who was the leader of the Communist Party? There was a particularly strong communist presence in the northern region. Chiang anticipated that with the assistance of the United States, either directly or indirectly, he would be able to grab control of the significant cities in northern China before the communists could take power. Despite the fact that the United States government assisted in transporting Chiang's nationalist troops to various regions. The American military was instructed to maintain a strict neutrality throughout the conflict. In October 1945, the U.S., with the assistance of the 14th Air Force, 50,000 members of the 92nd and 94th Chinese Nationalist Armies were transported by air to Peiping, Beijing, and other critical locations. When the Americans were cooperating with Chiang and the Nationalists. They believed that they would be able to bring about a lasting peace among the Chinese people. In point of fact, United States President Harry Truman assigned General George C. Marshall to the position of Special Representative in November 1945, with the purpose of mediating the disagreements that existed between the Nationalists and the Communists. Truman was of the opinion that it was in the vital interest of the United States of America and the United Nations as a whole that the people of China not miss any opportunity to resolve their internal disagreements via peaceful negotiation. The foreign policy of the United States of America over the course of the past seven decades has frequently been founded on naive thinking and well-meaning mistakes. One of the underlying assumptions is that people in the United States have the know-how to solve problems that cannot be solved. 
there is a tendency to minimize or disregard profound cultural, religious, ethnic, and political differences in favor of an optimism that is almost always misguided. This is a problem that occurs far too frequently. This was the situation in Vietnam, and it was also the situation in China between the years 1945 and 1949. The Truman administration was confident that General Marshall would be able to negotiate a permanent peace between the most vehement of adversaries, adversaries who mistrusted each other and who were waiting for time to gain a decisive advantage over their competitors. As a consequence of this, the Marine IIIAC was left holding the bag, attempting to preserve a fragile neutrality in the face of a situation that was rapidly deteriorating. To be fair, there were some old China hands working in the State Department who were aware of the fact that the Chinese government was rife with corruption and cautioned the Truman administration about the situation. They could not be heard. Despite the fact that Chingang was not a prize, the fact that he was anti-communist seemed to be the only thing that mattered. The beginning of the Cold War coincided with the beginning of a new Red Scare, which was the fear that communism would spread throughout the world. The headquarters of the Marine IIAC Corps, along with the 1st Marine Division, would be stationed in and near the cities of Tanku, Tianjin, Peiping, and Qingwantao, which are located in Hope Province. Air support would be given by the 1st Marine Aircraft Wing, which would be comprised of a variety of aircraft, including Grumman F-7 F Tiger Cats. Airfields in the Tsingtao, Tintsin, and Peeping regions would be the locations where the pilots would be stationed. Furthermore, the 29th Marine Regiment, 6th Division was planned to have landed at Chefu. However, the plans had to be altered due to unforeseen circumstances. The communists had already taken control of the city, and they failed to cooperate with the government in any way. On account of this, young Private Stevens and the 29th Marines found themselves in the port of Tsingtao, which is today known as Qingdao, which is located on the shore of the Yellow Sea in China. Over the course of the German concession, which lasted from 1898 until 1914, Tsingtao served as the official administrative center. Despite the fact that they were legally leased from China, these concessions were in reality quasi-colonies that were owned by various European countries. Historic German colonial buildings continue to be a point of interest in Tsingtao even in modern times. The actions of the Europeans were not all negative. A beer that is currently the most popular brand in China was initially produced by the Germania Brewery, which was established in 1903 and began production of the beverage. Tsingtao was the location where the first Marines arrived on October 11, 1945, arriving in the early afternoon. A boisterous welcome was extended to the main body of the group by the Chinese population when they arrived on October 15th. Over the course of the journey, Private Stevens made an effort to pick up a few Chinese words. After hearing that Stevens knew Chinese, which was a significant exaggeration, Colonel Roston, the commander of the battalion, nominated the young Leatherneck as the official interpreter. Stevens gave it his, all despite the fact that all he knew were a few phrases that were considered standard, such as, Do you have your own rice bowl? China was in a state of disarray despite the conclusion of World War II. A roaring hyperinflation was brought about as a result of the war-torn economy and the political unpredictability. The rate of exchange was 10,000 Chinese yuan to $1 in United States currency. A delicious supper might cost $190,000, which is equivalent to approximately $19 in the United States. There were a great number of pubs and cabarets in each of the cities that were located in China. Despite the fact that Tsingtao was a fascinating city, there were several issues that required some adjustment. Beggars with ragged appearances filled the streets, and among them 
were a great number of youngsters who were living in poverty. With point of fact, Private Stevens' own unit, Fox Company, 2nd Battalion, 29th Marines, informally adopted a little Chinese beggar whom they dubbed Little Lou. They took care of him by cleaning him, feeding him, and dressing him with articles that were cut down from the conventional Marine uniform. However, in other parts of China, the news came over as less than encouraging. Chiang had committed a significant tactical error, which would ultimately result in the downfall of his rule on the whole. The Generalissimo focused his efforts on regaining control of Manchuria, and in the process, he led a significant number of his men to evacuate from northern China. The result was a power vacuum, which the communist Chinese were more than ready to fill without hesitation. Tsingtao has developed into a nationalist island within the sea of Shantung province, which is ruled by communists. Despite the fact that they were located in Hubei province, communists were often uncooperative and skeptical. There was a meeting between Marine Brigadier General William Wharton and Zhu Enlai, who would later become famous for his role as Mao Zedong's right-hand man and as the foreign minister for the People's Republic of China. It was made quite plain by Zhao, who was an exceptionally skilled negotiator, that the communists would put up a valiant effort to prevent the Marines from entering Pipe. Even after a turbulent hour with Zhu, Wharton managed to remain unfazed by the situation. He made the point that the IIIAC was a force that had been through a lot of combat and had better air power support. Although he was not searching for trouble, he knew that his marines were capable of overcoming any obstacle if they were forced to do so. After Zhou Enlai had met his match, he withdrew from the conflict after adamantly stating that he would have marine orders changed. The marines arrived in Peeping without any big incidents occurring. The official surrender of the Japanese garrison stationed at Tsingtao, which consisted of 10,000 warriors, took place on October 25, 1945. During the ceremony, which was led by the commander of the Marine 6th Division, Major General Lemuel Shepard, and Chinese Nationalist General Chen Chaotsang, the whole Marine 6th Division was present. Despite this, there was still a requirement for some Japanese forces to assist in maintaining the openness of the important rail lines in Shantung. The number of Marines and nationalist troops that were available was insufficient to protect all of the railroads. Despite this, Marines frequently found themselves in the position of train guards, which is considered to be one of the most hazardous missions throughout China. Although the winters in China were extremely severe, the great city of Shanghai, which was a metropolis with a population of 3 million people, required a steady supply of coal from the north in order to continue functioning. Marine riflemen, who were shivering from the frigid gusts that swept in from the Gopi Desert, kept vigil to ensure that the trains had the ability to continue operating because Shanghai required 100,000 tons of coal every month. It was not long before the Marines and Communist Chinese militants began to engage in violent confrontations, which eventually became practically routine. The Communists made an attempt to disrupt the railroad tracks, and on occasion, they would sneak up on passing trains and shoot them. A Communist ambush was carried out on a train that was heading from Tangshan to Chinwanto during the conflict that would subsequently be referred to as the Kue Incident. This was a special train that was carrying General DeWitt Peck, who was the commander of the Marine First Division, as well as a Marine inspection team. The communists opened fire from the settlement of Kuya, which was relatively close to the train track, only 500 yards away. The better part of three hours passed during the course of the battle that broke out. Although air support was requested, Marine pilots were unable to make a clear distinction between the locations where communist forces were congregating. Therefore, permission to start fire was not granted since there was a concern that civilians would also be hit. The 7th Marines sent a relief unit to the area, but by the time they arrived, 
the communists had already dispersed into the surrounding countryside. In spite of the fact that the train remained in QA for the night, it was discovered that communists had destroyed almost 400 yards of railroad track when it resumed its journey the next day. The Chinese railroad crews that were attempting to repair the line were ambushed by communist troops that were waiting inside the line. The efforts of General Peck to travel by rail to Chinwangtao were unsuccessful. Rather than continuing on to Tanku, he decided to take a flight in an observation plane this time. As a result of the episode, it became clear how tightly the Chinese communists controlled the province. General Peck was of the opinion that a nationalist offensive was required in order to free the crucial rail links from interference from communist forces. General Tu Liming, who was in charge of the Northeast China Command, was the one that Peck approached in order to make arrangements for such a sweep. Despite the fact that Tu quickly consented, he made a request that Marines protect all of the large rail bridges that are located between Tanku and Chinwangtao, which is around 135 miles away. For the sake of the offensive, this would allow for the release of additional Chinese nationalist troops. The Marines gradually came to the realization that their mission was transforming into something that was far different from the task that they had been given initially. When Private Stevens indicated that their primary purpose was to assist in the return of Japanese citizens, he came dangerously close to getting into a brawl. And further Marine erupted in rage upon hearing this information. Make sure you don't offer me that nonsense in a commanding tone, he stated. Marines are currently stationed in North China in order to provide support for Chiang's regime. In addition, a great number of Marines began to comprehend that Chiang's government was so corrupt that it could not be possibly saved. When American servicemen observed the severe poverty that was all around them, the reckless indifference to human life, and the activities that included selling young Chinese girls into sexual slavery in brothels, they were shocked. It appeared as though almost anything would be preferable than the existing regime. In 1946, there was a significant reduction in the number of Marines stationed in China. It was decided to dismantle the 6th Marine Division, and the Marines that were stationed in Tsingtao were reduced to a reinforced brigade. The repatriation of Japanese citizens was proceeding smoothly, which was ironically helped by the growing presence of communists. People of Japanese nationality, whether they were members of the military or the civilian population, had no desire to be subjected to the benevolence of any Chinese. But they were especially afraid of the communists. As communist forces, such as the 8th Rote Army, advanced, the Japanese started to gather their belongings and make their way to Tsingtao, which was the primary port of embarkation. The conflicts that were taking place between the Marines and the communist Chinese guerrillas appeared to increase in both number and severity. Seven Marines who, who which were taken captive by communist militants on July 13, 1946. They were taken by surprise. Following a series of discussions, the Leathernecks were finally freed on July 24. However, the communists insisted that the United States government apologize for invading a liberated region. This posturing was ignored by the United States administration, which then issued its own significant protest in response. A Marine convoy that was traveling from Tientsin to Peiping was ambushed at Anping on July 29, 1946, just a few days after the initial Marine convoy occurred. The column was made up of cargo trucks, jeeps, and a few United States vehicles. There are Army. Staff cars that are transporting personnel to the capital of China. Second Lieutenant Douglas A. Corwin was in charge of the escort, which included a total of 31 individuals from the 1st Battalion, as well as a 60 mm mortar unit consisting of 10 individuals from the 1st Reserve. Additionally, there were several Marines who were selected to replace the column. A barricade consisting of ox carts was reached by the Marine convoy, and as a result, 
Corwin, and an advance team left to examine the situation. All of a sudden, a dozen hand grenades were hurled from some bushes that were located close. Due to the fact that there was no time for Corwin or the soldiers immediately surrounding him to react or take cover, they were all either dead or injured. It was quickly followed by the truck drivers and other staff in the convoy jumping out of their trucks and taking cover. There was heavy fire coming from the right, the left, and the rear of the convoy, which gave the impression that it was trout. Platoon Sergeant Cecil Flanagan assumed charge at this point and commanded the return fire in an effective manner. According to reports, the communists were taken aback by the presence of mortars in the column, and their offensive strategies were thrown off balance as a result of well-directed shells. Every time the communists attempted to launch an assault on the convoy, their troop concentrations were discovered before they could go very far. After being located, the 60 mm mortars immediately got to work, firing round after round into the positions held by the adversary. Due to the fact that the communists were so disoriented as a result of this mortar fire, a marine vehicle that was coming from behind was able to burst through and go for assistance. Radios were present in the column. However, the range of these radios was unfortunately restricted. Over the course of approximately four hours, the convoy engaged in combat with the communists. Almost quickly, a rescue team was sent out and the communists eventually decided to refrain from continuing their assault. In comparison to other incidents, this one was the most serious one. It was reported that there were 300 communists in the force. All of them were armed with rifles, grenades, and automatic guns. The current tally of casualties among the marines was 5 dead and 12 wounded. A minimum of 12 communist Chinese soldiers were slain, and it is possible that many more were murdered. Because the communists had a pattern of stealing their deceased, it was incredibly challenging to arrive at an accurate number by themselves. At the beginning of 1947, it became abundantly evident that General Marshall's attempt to broker peace between communists and nationalists was a complete and utter failure. Therefore, President Truman issued an order for all United States military personnel to return home, but the process of disengagement was going to be a lengthy and laborious one. The units were moved about after which they were eventually removed. It was quite obvious that Chiang's regime was going to be overthrown. On the evening of April 4 and 5, 1947, the military of the United States Marine Corps and the Communists of China engaged in their final and most significant conflict. At Sinho, Mao's forces, which were later renamed to People's Liberation Army, PLA, launched an assault on an ammo depot that was held by Marine Unit personnel. Approximately 350 men were reported to be part of the attacking army, which meant that the Americans were vastly outnumbered. The harsh tones of a Chinese bugle call were heard, which shattered the peace and calm of the night. In the past, when the PLA launched an offensive, it was customary for them to blow bugles. This strategy would be utilized at a later point in time during the Korean War. The initial assault resulted in the deaths of five Marines, and the remaining Marines were put under intense pressure to keep the enemy at bay. In light of the fact that the PLA commander had anticipated the arrival of American reinforcements, he positioned a mine in the road in the area where one may anticipate receiving assistance at any moment. Undoubtedly, a truck carrying a relief force made its way up the road and swiftly collided with the mine a short time later. After jumping from the vehicle, the relief workers engaged in a fierce gunfight with the enemy. The Marines were able to eventually obtain the upper hand in the situation, which had been in question on multiple occasions. As was the case before, communist forces withdrew from the conflict and disappeared into the shadows. During the attack, the adversary was successful in stealing some ammunition crates, 
which appeared to be one of their primary objectives with regard to the operation. Private Stevens, too, had his fair share of exciting experiences. His aim was to try to save some nuns and Chinese orphan children who were located in a remote area known as Loshan. He joined a small operation that consisted of only a handful of Marines. As a result of the nuns' refusal to depart, the mission was unsuccessful. However, much more terrible things were to come. Bandits took Stevens and his party captive and held them captive. Everyone was put to death, but Stevens was spared, perhaps due to the fact that he was fluent in Chinese. Almost immediately, Stevens was handed over to a communist officer who was a member of the 8th Route Army Corps. In order to identify himself as a prisoner, he was given a tattoo of a Chinese character on his arm. Soon after, he discovered that he was a member of a work crew that was stationed on an island that was used for coal storage. A significant portion of the inmates' work consisted of shoveling coal to flat-bottomed boats that were moored along the shore. Mao was preparing for a major naval assault against the nationalists, says Stevens now, and his ships needed coal to run their steam engines. Although it was a laborious task, he was fortunate enough to be transferred to assist fishermen in working their nets. It was imperative that he fled, and he had to return to his squad. Following a period of thoughtful deliberation, he came up with a proposal that was acceptable but dangerous. Through the use of a small boat, he would pretend to inspect the nets that were located the farthest away from the shore. As soon as he was in the right place, he would plunge into the ocean and, with any luck, get scooped up by a passing junk. The events transpired exactly as intended, with the exception of the water being quite icy. He was, in fact, picked up by a junk, and kind Chinese crewmen hauled him out of the ocean, practically dead from the cold. In the end, a warship from the United States was able to grab the debris. Now he was free. During the month of November 1948, the United States Embassy issued a statement that declared any American citizen who does not wish to remain in North China should plan to leave at once by United States. Naval vessel at Tenson. By the end of the month, consular personnel, the remaining American civilians, and military dependents were being shipped out of North China. Beginning with the first Yankee traders who sailed to Canton in the 1780s, the American presence in China was coming to an abrupt end. This was the beginning of the American presence in China. Beginning with President Richard Nixon's visit to China in 1972, there would be no further communication with China. When spring arrived in 1949, the United States military had practically finished withdrawing all of its forces from the country. The United States of America did so in February of that year. Air Facility of the United States Marine Corps in Tsingtao was disbanded. After the removal of all of the ground equipment, the aircraft belonging to the fighter squadron VMF-211 took off in the direction of their new home, which was the escort carrier Randova. After leaving Tsingtao on May 25, 1949, Company C of the 7th Marines, which was the last American force still present on Chinese land, departed. In all honesty, it was the end of an era.